Uh, good morning, and thank you for joining me, as always, as we continue exploring the subject uh, of the Holy Spirit. You know, last week we engaged in a study looking at the idea of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And if you remember in that study, we affirmed what we believe the Bible proclaims clearly, the idea that the Holy Spirit does indeed dwell in the Christian. There's no debating that. As we begin this morning, I just want you to consider a few passages that I believe confirm this truth that we looked at last week. Romans chapter 8, if you have your Bibles. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 9. The Apostle Paul says, however, if you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, through the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 6 at verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? 2 Timothy 1 at verse 14, protect the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. James 4 at verse 5, or do you think that the Holy Spirit says to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit whom he has made to dwell in us. Now, with, without exploring the context of those verses, I, I, I think that it becomes abundantly clear um, that there's little to no doubt that the Holy Spirit dwells in the Christian. And we also noted, not only does the Holy Spirit, who is deity, distinct member of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, not only does the Holy Spirit dwell in the Christian, but too, God the Father dwells in the Christian, and God the Son dwells in the Christian. And not only that, the Christian dwells in, in the Father, dwells in, in, in the Son. First uh, John chapter 4, verse 12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we remain in him and he in us, because he has given to us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him, and he in God. We've come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. The Apostle John affirms the Father dwells in the Christian, but not only that, the Christian dwells in the Father. We looked at Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 at verse 17. For this reason, Paul says, I bend my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner cells, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through Faith, that's important, may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love. Paul affirms here, the son dwells in the Christian through faith, but not only that, just as the father and son both dwell in the Christian, just as the Christian dwells in the father, the Christian also dwells in the son. John 16 and verse 56, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Now, as we noted last week in our study, when we study scripture, we take God's word literally unless there's a logical or reasonable explanation to take it symbolically, to take it figuratively. So the question becomes here, as Brother Rogers brings up in his book, how can a person dwell in a person who is dwelling within him? Now, that becomes impossible if you take this literally. Now, I think to the reasonable person, it becomes rather clear that this is not dealing with a literal or even a miraculous indwelling. Brother, I think the answer is clear. The idea of deity, whether it be God the Father, God the Son, or the Holy Spirit for that matter, the idea of deity dwelling in the Christian, it's pointing to, it's emphasizing this closeness of the relationship between deity and the Christian. It's emphasizing fellowship. Fellowship so close that it uses this idea, this figure of dwelling in one another. You know, ultimately, we're talking about being led. We're talking about influence. We're talking about strength through the word of God revealed by the Holy Spirit. As the Christian studies and meditates and, and allows uh, the revealed word by the Holy Spirit to lead and change them, we certainly see the influence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. We see the influence of God the Father in the life of the Christian. We see the influence of God the Son in the life of the Christian. And in that sense, dwelling in the Christian, you know, I think this idea is most obvious in a couple of passages that, that we have explored in, in previous classes. 
If you turn your Bibles with me over to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, I want you to listen to the Apostle Paul as he's led by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 18. He says, do not get drunk with wine in which there is debauchery, but be filled, he says, with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody with your hearts to the Lord. Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, consider Colossians 3 at verse 16. Colossians 3 at verse 16, Paul, again, led by the Holy Spirit, says, let the word of Christ dwell, dwell, richly, dwell richly within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God. God the Father. Paul says here, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Now, when you consider these two passages together, I believe that it expresses the idea that we've been driving really throughout this study, but specifically over the last couple of classes. You see, to be filled with the Spirit is to allow the word of Christ to dwell richly within you. The Holy Spirit certainly dwells in the Christian. This takes place through the Word of God, when one is filled with the Spirit, when one lets the Word of Christ richly dwell within them. Certainly, we see the strength. We see the influence of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them through the Word of God. But let's go in this direction. You know, for the person that advocates and says, yeah, I just believe it's a literal indwelling, miraculous indwelling. Maybe I can't tell you exactly how or exactly what it does. I just believe that I've experienced this literal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And for those who make a, a claim such as that, let's just be reminded, as I say often, beliefs have consequences. Ideas have consequences. Can I consider just a couple with me this morning? My, my, my first question if the Holy Spirit literally dwells in the Christian, in the Christian, my first question, what about the Word of God? What is the need for this? And I think it speaks to the question of, is the Word of God sufficient or not? Now, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 makes the case that, that it is. And if the Holy Spirit literally dwells in the Christian, providing guidance and strength separate and apart from the Word of God, what does that say for the all-sufficiency of the Scripture? And to take it even further, if the Holy Spirit is literally guiding someone as it dwells inside of us, do we even need the Word of God? And for those who advocate for a literal indwelling, I think those questions at the very least need to be considered, right? And what's the next step? If one person claims to have a literal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, are we to ignore that person when they claim that the Holy Spirit is leading them or laying something on their heart that maybe, how about this, goes beyond or comes up short of what the Word of God says? And then there's this, Brother Rogers in his book on the Holy Spirit, he makes the point that I've seen other brethren make, and I think it's certainly something to consider. Think for a moment about what made Jesus different than any other human to ever walk the face of this earth. We, we know that Jesus was both God and flesh. Matthew 1 and verse 23 tells us that deity dwelt in his physical body. Matthew 1 and verse 23 tells us, Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And we know Jesus was both man and God. He was deity and humanity. He was Emmanuel, God with us. Now, I realize this is getting into the weeds somewhat, this is maybe a little uh, difficult for a study that, that's taking place <laughs> in, in, in a video, but, but just hang with me for a moment. If deity is literally and miraculously dwelling in us, the Christian, me and you, would we not also be Emmanuel, God, with us? Now, obviously, no serious Bible student would ever make that claim. But you see the road this takes us down? And what about this? Hasn't the miraculous age ended? You know, a literal and, and personal indwelling of deity, one would have to acknowledge that would be miraculous. Um, is that still happening? Now, I want to introduce this, and I want to return to it possibly next week in our study. I want you to turn with me this morning over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know, the church at Corinth was a local work, and it was written with problems that, that needed to be corrected, and one of those being the misuse of miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit.
Now, and, and Paul, in, in his writing to them, he spends a considerable amount of time dealing with this and addressing these issues in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, well, we get a list. I don't think it's an exhaustive list, but we get a list of, of those miraculous lists that was given these first century Christians. And we'll see that we're for purpose and for a duration, I believe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 8, it says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of the tongues. But, but one in the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. And the Paul made clear miraculous gifts given by the Holy Spirit existed in the first century as the word of God was being revealed, as it was being confirmed. Now, remember, at this point in history, a unique time in history for sure, God's will was still being revealed to mankind by the Holy Spirit through the apostles, just as he promised that he would. Back in John, you remember we spent some time in John 14 through, verse, through chapter 16. And these miraculous gifts were used as a means of revelation and confirmation. Now, it's important to understand the first century church, these Christians did not have the New Testament in completed form. They were getting it in pieces. They were getting it in parts. Therefore, they were reliant upon miraculous gifts as they received the word in part, received the word in pieces. Uh, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 14 at verse 26, what is the outcome then, brothers and sisters? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. All things are, be, are to be done for edification. And through these gifts, those who had been given these gifts through the uh, laying on of the apostles' hands, we'll talk about that in just a moment, they would prophesy or speak in tongues as the inspired word of God would be revealed. So these miraculous gifts, they were an instrument of revelation and certainly of confirmation as well. How would they know if this was true, if it was truly from God or not? Now, we know from scriptures as the apostles and teachers went about proclaiming the word of God, they were accompanied with miraculous gifts to confirm they were from God. Acts chapter 8 is, is an excellent example uh, of this. In Acts chapter 8, you remember verse 5 where it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he began proclaiming the crime, proclaiming the Christ to them. And the crowds were paying attention with one mind to what was being said by Philip. Why? Look what he says. As they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. They took Philip's message seriously. They took it to heart. As they saw his message was accompanied by these signs he was performing, obviously his message was from God. But what about when God's revelation was completed? Would there still be a need for those miraculous gifts? Now keep in mind, God has a reason for what he does. And if we can understand the purpose of these miraculous gifts, I think it helps us to better understand the absence and the lack of need for them today. Now consider this. Scripture tells us there was but one way for a person to receive the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. That was through the laying on of hands of the apostles. Now, without going too far into this, just a couple of passages to consider. And back in Acts chapter 8, you'll remember how a couple of apostles, Peter and John, they were sent to the new converts in Samaria to lay hands on them, to impart the Holy Spirit. And you remember it was in this instance where Simon the sorcerer wanted the ability to do this. He tried to buy the ability, not just to do the miraculous gift, use the miraculous gift, but to impart the miraculous gifts through the laying on of hands. And I said, hey, look at verse 14. It says, now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they would receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the gift was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. The apostles had the ability to do this. No one else. That's why Peter and John was sent. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6, this is exactly what we see in Paul laying hands on Timothy and Timothy receiving these miraculous gifts. Paul would say in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6, for this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And when the reasonable and logical mind, I think, thinks through this, the question that one has to ask 
if the apostles had to lay hands on the Christian for the Christian to receive uh, these miraculous gifts, what about this? Are the apostles still around today? Well, no. You consider the qualifications, by the way, the apostles, there's no apostles around today. All the apostles died. We know that. So what does that do for those who claim to have been imparted in some way with miraculous gifts today? For their miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit were for a duration of time. Therefore, a specific time as the part was coming to maturity as, as God, the Holy Spirit, was revealing his will. These miraculous gifts were used in revelation and confirmation until the complete. Now, if you have an issue by way in which God chose to reveal himself, we understand God being God. He could have done it however he wanted, but you have to take that up with God. This was God's choice. These miraculous gifts, the Holy Spirit, a duration of time, a specific time for a specific purpose. Now, that's the point, I think that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where Paul essentially says there will be an end to this. A time is coming when these gifts, well, they won't be needed. If you still got your Bibles open, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, look at verse 8. Love never fails, he says, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Paul makes the point here that love is superior to the gifts of prophecy. Tongues, why? They'll be done away with. They'll vanish. Paul makes clear that, that there will be a time when prophecies, tongues, miraculous knowledge, and so on, these things will vanish away. They'll cease. In verse 10, he says these things would vanish when the perfect comes. So the question becomes, what is the perfect? And I realize there's some debate about this, but I think it's rather clear by the way of the context. Verse 9 tells us, for we know in part and prophesy in part. Now consider for a moment the purpose of these gifts. They were the means by way of God's revelation by the Holy Spirit in absence of his completed will. So God's will through these means were being revealed in parts, in pieces. But Paul makes clear that the perfect was coming, and when the perfect comes, it will take the place of the part, the part being God's revelation in part, revealed using his miraculous gifts in pieces and parts. The perfect here is the entirety of God's revelation. When that is complete, there will be no miraculous gifts. There will be no need for them. God's revelation is complete. It's sufficient. Uh, Paul continues in verse 11 down this line of thought. He says, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I've also been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love remain, these three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, Paul talks here about the transition that takes place from childhood to manhood. And certainly we understand the maturation process that takes place from childhood to adulthood. As a child, there are things you need. You need your parents. You need help. Uh, there's a huge difference right now between what Annabelle needs and what Anderson needs. They're about eight years, eight or nine years uh, apart in, in age. He is maturing. As he mature, he needs less, right? You know, as a child, you need your parents, you need help, but there's a time in your life where you can't care for yourself, you need help, but that maturation process, it allows you to eliminate the help and care for yourself. Well, I think what Paul's saying here, in the same way, when you consider the first century church in its infancy, without the completed revelation of God, it was God's choice to reveal his will by the Holy Spirit to the apostles who were given miraculous gifts by the Holy Spirit by way of revelation and confirmation. It was the apostles, the laying on of hands, who would impart these gifts to brethren to reveal and to confirm his will, just as we saw happening in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But the time came when God's will was complete. It was spoken, it was recorded, and preserved for even us, brethren. And as a result, the perfect, the complete has come, leaving us without the need for miraculous gifts. So I say again, let's treasure the perfect. 
Let's treasure God's completed will. Let's be thankful that we live in a time where we can know and, and be certain of what God expects of us. We can know his precious promises. We need no latter day revelation. God's will is sufficient. We'll talk more about this in coming classes, but I hope some of this helps. Uh, let's pray together. Thank you for joining me this morning. Our Father in heaven, Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Uh, Father, we are so thankful for this Lord's Day, for the opportunity that is ours to, to be in your word. And Father, in just a, a few moments, we're going to come together as your church, and we're going to praise you with everything we've got, understanding, God, that you are the giver of all good things. Father, for your Son, we are so thankful. For your Spirit, Father, that has revealed your mind to us, Father, we are most thankful. Father, help us to be men and women of wisdom, to allow your word to train us, to be people of discernment, to have the ability, Father, to discern not only what is good, not only what is right and wrong, but what is better, what is best. Father, we love you. We long to be with you. We're thankful for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.